Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audio download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Allen. And Allen is spelled A-L-A-N for those that don't know. Again, audibletrial.com slash Allen. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. This episode is a second episode from our live event, Marketing Today Live. It was recorded back in November of 2019. This episode is going to be with Jim Geike, who's one of the partners at One Better Ventures. And I'm going to do an intro regarding Jim's background in a few minutes to the live audience, but it probably helps to understand who One Better Ventures is. And the way they describe themselves is One Better Ventures nurtures and develops consumer brands that have a positive impact on the world. They advise, invest in, and incubate mission-driven ventures with breakthrough sustainable business models. Their track record includes building businesses like Burt's Bees, Seventh Generation, and leading them to successful exits. They currently invest in innovative ventures like Lisa's Sleep, Filter Easy, and many, many, many others. They donate 10% of their profits to charity, another 10% to an employee bonus pool, and believe in a deep commitment to service and corporate citizenship in the community. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jim Geike. Jim Geike. Jim is partner at One Better Ventures, which nurtures and develops consumer brands that have a positive impact on the world. Prior, Jim spent 18 years at Unilever before joining Burt's Bees, where he led the retail strategy, brand marketing, business development, and international prior to serving as its general manager for the business overall. He also then, at one point in in the many years, you led Cree's entry into the consumer lighting market and then led the commercial strategy and startup skincare device maker, La Lumiere. That is a mouthful. So welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you guys all for coming to listen. Yeah. I want to get started because One Better Ventures is set out to do something different in the investment space. You're in kind of the venture capital, private equity space. And I want to ask you kind of a provocative question because it's a question on the podcast in many episodes I've come back to with different guests. More recently, a guy that I have valued very much. He runs, uh, his name is Phil Harvey. It's the longest episode I think I've done because he gave me like an hour and a half, but he runs, uh, he started what is now Adam and Eve. So selling adult products, let's say, <laughs> for those that, that, that need them. My uh, mind is spinning just so you know, like I'm not sure where we're going with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come back. I'll come back. I promise. Um, but the, the interesting thing about Phil is that most people don't know is that he is also probably single-handedly started, well, he has almost single-handedly with a couple partners, started three other NGOs around the globe that they distribute, I think it is now, 80 million condoms around the world to prevent and drive down HIV rates, Mm -hmm. as well as give people their own freedom and planning when they want to have kids, which has a dramatic impact in places like Sub-Saharan Africa when there's not enough food to feed your family. But the funny thing is I thought we would get into this conversation with him talking about how he wants to see the world be a better place. And it was like a left turn out of nowhere where he told me he's a Milton Friedman acolyte. Hmm. For those that don't know who Milton Friedman is, I may get this a little off, but he's a famous economist, most notably known for saying companies have a single solitary purpose to provide money to shareholders. Shareholder primacy. Yes. Yep. So therein lies my question. Uh, Long way around. But what would you say to other Milton Friedman purists that say that's the only reason a company exists. So the nice thing about this day and age is those two things aren't as as at odds as they might have been 25 or 30 years ago. And I'll explain why. So the easiest part right now is you can point to a lot of examples, including Unilever, where I sort of started out. The chairman of Unilever said last year that his brands that are focused on making a positive social impact are actually growing three times faster than the rest of the portfolio. Another example, Avon, where everybody knows in the United States, Avon was just sold to a Brazilian company called Natura. Natura is a $2 billion Latin American wonderful brand that is a B Corp. And they also own The Body Shop, which is a neat erotics British company. So, you know, they've created this portfolio of mission-driven beauty care brands. They do $11 billion a year in revenue. So they're actually the largest B Corp certified company on the planet. So... 
instead of profits getting in the way of social responsibility or social responsibility getting in the way of profits, what's actually happened now is there's enough examples where people understand that it's profit because of purpose. And so these two things are much more compatible and complementary than they are at odds anymore. And God bless the people that were doing this 30 years ago where, you know, Milton Friedman his whole idea was actually a decent idea, which was simply the leadership team or the CEO's job is to serve the board of directors or the shareholders. I get that. But it, it turned into this like profit at the expense of anything else, which actually turned into this whole greed is good mindset that we lived with here in the 80s and 90s and Gordon Gecko and Enron and all that stuff. So the nice thing about doing this as long as I have done it is in 30 years, you get to see the entire arc of this from the pit of what business really can be as money crubbing profit only enterprises to actually successful businesses that you'd be happy to put your money into that also, by the way, actually happen to do some good around the world. Well, it's just one last thing. I know yeah. I'm sort of going on about the one point is if you really start out at the biggest point, we can all agree that this world's got a lot of problems, you know, environmental problems, natural resources going away, equity problems, you know, gender equity, lifestyle equity, whatever you want to call it. The world is full of problems and there is nothing more powerful on the planet than business. And so a lot of people, including I and my firm, believe that with power comes responsibility and you have an obligation in order to sort of do leave the world a better place than what you found it and make a profit along the way. You know, we are we make these investments with our own personal money because we get good returns. And so the idea that you can actually do good and do well is actually a pretty motivating idea if you can do it right. I think that so deserves there, an Friedman. applause. I think that <laughs> deserves that. an applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, I'm thankful that there are people like you in the world, frankly, because I think to your point, you didn't go there, but I'll go there, which is the feedback loop as companies get larger and larger and larger, I won't name them because uh, I might want their CMO to come on my podcast and they won't come if I name them out loud. But if you think of big companies, maybe big retailers, right? And over time, as they got bigger and bigger, they went from small local communities to big behemoths. The feedback loop of when they did something that people didn't like wasn't working quite well. And I think they took that profit maximization lever and pushed it to the to the edge. I think it eventually self-corrects itself, but it takes a long, long, long time to do that. So I'm, I'm glad that there's good money, so to speak, putting practice and purpose together. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because actually I, I feel fortunate because I get to do this in this day and age, mm -hmm. not on the people that were really paving the path back in the 80s and or really the 90s and the early 2000s because they were the ones that were the salmon swimming upstream. Now we're actually swimming downstream, which does make it easier. And so like the standing on the shoulders of giants does kind of apply here. But yeah, like this idea of trade-offs, you can actually get big without selling out. Like mm -hmm. that was the big thing. Oh, they've sold out. Whether you're a band that started in Austin <laughs> or Athens, Georgia, and then got big and you sold out. Yeah, well, right. this idea of selling out, you can go big without selling out now. And, and what's happening is you don't get the pressure from your corporate parents anymore because what they're not trying to do is harvest the equity that's been built. They're actually trying to build on it and incorporate that into their other brands. And so like when we sold Burt's Bees to Clorox, that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly why this big company, their only business that's not in Oakland, California is over here in Durham because they wanted it to be a, a learning function for them to sort of incorporate that into the other parts of their business. And they actually, through great expense and disruption to people's family, they move a lot of people here from California so that they can work in it for 18 months or three years and sort of learn enough about it to bring it back and incorporate. So it's actually a sort of self-reinforcing thing where there's not this pressure to harvest or compromise or trade, you know, sort of lie about it. And last thing that underpins this is consumers these days have got a really high bullshit detector. Like they really can smell BS a mile away. And if you think you're smart enough to BS the consumers, you're probably <laughs> going to get found out at some point. And so it does catch up to you and it might be short term beneficial, but it's long term value destroying. So honestly, this fight between the marketers and the finance people just doesn't exist because the finance people know that this is really the, the long term means to their end. Let's talk a little bit about one better venture. So if I understand, um, you guys focus primarily on growth stage versus say early stage or seed stage companies. And it's just curious, what's the rationale behind that? And then, you know, does that prevent cause you any challenges along the way? Sure. So so um, just a quick one on One Better Ventures for those of you who don't know it. We do advising and investing work with early stage, but growth stage companies. And um, we have five criteria. We It's all consumer products. So I am an inch wide and a mile deep. I've spent 30 years only in consumer. So I can't talk about any other category <laughs> other than that. We only work with B Corps or companies that could be certified B Corps if they bothered to go through the process. So we're looking for people that are walking the talk on, on mission. We have a real preference for this region. Surprisingly, this is 
is a tech and life sciences town or region, but there's a ton of consumer products talent that kind of were educated here or are from here and want to actually work here. And so a lot, a lot of people in the room here are actually part of a group that's really trying to stand up a consumer products industry in this town. And there's a lot of really great early stage stuff going on mm -hmm. here. So I think the future is bright. And we look for teams that we have good chemistry in because by design, we're putting minority stakes into these companies because we want the founding team to hang around. But when you're putting minority money in, you want to make sure that you're like-minded enough that you're not going to, we want the advice to be taken alongside the money. So this is a people business at the end of the day. I know machines aren't going to take over my job because it really is about working with people in the right way. So that's kind of what we're about. The reason we focus on growth stage or companies with 10 million or more in revenue is because the work in an, in an entrepreneurial startup is just vastly different from the work in a growth stage business. And I, I'm just humble enough to know that I can't do the startup work. You know, that's for another group of people who are wired to do that, where what ends up happening is like the sheer force of will and worth ethic, ethic usually from the founder or a small founding team, does everything and makes every decision. But what we generally find is a business usually reaches a sort of an inflection point where the complexity of the business just outstrips the ability of one good, smart, hardworking person to just flat out do everything. And that's really where we step in because where we try to give our advice and work hand in hand with startup founders, they don't really want that. What they really want is the money because they're trying to keep you know, write cash checks for people right, on Friday. Right. They don't really want the advice because they're so clear in their mind about what needs to get done and how to do it. So yeah. that is very different in a growth stage business where people are like, oh my God, I got it this far, but I have no idea what to do now. So that's where we bring in, you know, we bring in good basic processes that were learned in places like Unilever and Burt's Bees and Clorox, and we strip them down to their bare bones and apply them in small businesses. And so it's that idea where a CEO can't do everything. They need a CMO and they need a head of supply supply chain and they need specialist functions and they need to figure out how to work together and sort of divide up the work. And so we're, I think, quite good at that. We're self-aware enough to know that we're not made for entrepreneurial stuff. And so we focus on what we're good at. I'm sorry. One last thing. Our, yeah. our problem <laughs> is that we're so seduced by the amazing startup work that's going on that we're like, oh, well, they're on a run rate to $10 million. And we have this <laughs> crazy internal justification about how they're really farther along than they actually are. But the truth is when we do make those exceptions, we regret it because they're not further along. They're just more interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> Wishful thinking. It's a crazy little dynamic. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. You have to really be disciplined about yourself to not get too romanced in the in the. Yeah, one, one small little thing that may be interesting. We also were born and raised in these larger $50 billion global multinationals, and we know how they think. And so it makes it easier for us to transition a business to those people because mm -hmm. we know what they're going through, how they think, what their processes are like, and we can position things. You know, we've walked in their shoes, so we can right. position things in a way that make more sense to them. So we just play this nice balance of avoiding work that we're not good at, working a stage that we've got some skill at, and then being able to hand off appropriately. That's awesome. So what do you look for in a company's, say, brand before making an investment? Meaning because you're, you're coming from a consumer background, I'm assuming that there is a need to have something there you, if you're at a 10 million or or higher growth rate? We could try a hundred things, but we know five things matter. Right. <laughs> so we've actually gotten good at being serious about the five things that matter. And so one is on brand, one is on product, one is on team, one is on one financial metric, and one is on commercial metric. And so yeah. if we get the right answer to these four, five questions, we usually are more successful than not. On brand, we look for the intensity of the consumer connection. So we don't care about large followerships or you know the scale of your presence. We care about the intensity. You know, mm -hmm. we're looking for small and mighty. We're looking for cult followings. We're looking for this little thing that's captured the imagination of a small group of people that we feel that we can then get to the next rings in the pool. Brands are really all about ideas that allow people to sort of like be better and more meaningful, you know, live better. And so like we find things that are special and that have captured the imagination of a small group of people. So the branding thing really ends up in testing that. The commercial part, we simply look at an a D2C business, for example, we look at simple ratios of cost of acquisition to lifetime value. And if, we, if we've got the right simple ratios on, on a D2C business, we know we can find the right audiences and basically fill the funnel in a pretty similar way. So that, that's, and if you understand that metric, it translates into revenue. So we don't have to spend any time unpacking all of the highs and lows of revenue mm -hmm. because we know we can draw a line from CAC and LTV to a, you know, your revenue part. So those are two. The third one is finance. Like the finance people, 
We've found that in a consumer products business, gross margin is everything. Like it's the money that's left over after you've made the product and it's the fuel to do everything else that you'd ever want to do as a business. You'd want to market the business, you want to hire a team and you want to deliver a profit. And if we find good gross margin businesses, which ultimately mean they're actually able to charge more than what it costs them to make and probably more than their competitors, that's a real sign of overall health and it's indicative of everything else. And so a consumer products business that has a really good gross margin or a path to gross margin is gold. So we don't spend a lot of time in the rest of the balance sheet or the rest of the, of the income statement. So that's three. The other one is team. Team is everything. We really come back to that. This is a people business. You know, we look for strong leadership. We look for really powerful cultures and we look for a couple of good capabilities that we can then build onto. And then, and I guess the yeah. last one is product. So it all yeah. comes down to product. We look for star products. We look for the one gem in a portfolio, like Burt's Bees made 350 products, but it lived and died on lip balm. That was the horse. <laughs> when you hit the recession, you went back to lip balm, it paid the bills and allowed you to do everything else. And so I would much rather have a portfolio where you had five star products than I would 350 sort of like me too things. You can always count on the horse. Tell us about the types of companies you're investing in now and if you've had any exits along the way at this point. Yeah. So I've talked to you about the criteria yeah. already, but the, we're all in the health and wellness business. We're health and wellness people. We think that health and wellness is one of the biggest sort of issues in this country right now for a lot of reasons, including the food supply in this country. I could get on my soapbox and probably half of you would agree <laughs> and half of you would say, I'm stupid as we eat pizza and <laughs> all the rest of it. But we're health and wellness people. We believe in the power of natural and organic products. We believe in diet, exercise, sleep, and managing stress. Like that's, those are the four legs of the wellness stool. And our portfolio has ended up in those types of companies. We've got to play in the sleep industry. We think sleep is, Americans get terrible sleep and sleep is an underappreciated part of health and wellness. So we've got a little bit of the bed in the box. Sleep movement is pretty great. It's a $15 billion category mm -hmm. where people are now able to sort of at your computer, buy a really high quality mattress, have it delivered to your house and have everything else taken care of. So it's an it's amazing industry and it will grow from 2 billion to 15 billion in the next five years. We've got a number of plays in vitamins, minerals, and supplements, including CBD oil. Like we believe, we just believe for a lot of reasons from the end consumer's health and wellness to the farmers in North Carolina that are growing it and all the people in the middle that this is an industry that will go from being illegal 18 months ago to being a $25 billion business that provides enormous relief for a lots and lots of people. A tons of science yeah. that needs to go into proving it out, but we just think there's a there there. Right. And after the hundreds of millions of dollars of clinical research goes into it, it's going to prove out the overwhelming anecdotal evidence that supports it today. So we have a lot of vitamins, minerals, well, minerals I, and supplements. I just want to jump in on yeah. that because as a North Carolina native, if we could transition from tobacco to uh. hemp or other marijuana forms, we could change our entire state's trajectory. It's just a cool topic because on one hand, it's sort of still quasi know, dicey right. and illegal, yeah, semi-illegal. Yeah. Like, is it okay to talk about social stigma and all that? But if you talk to the farmers in North Carolina, where we've spent a lot of time, they make about $4,000 an acre on cotton. And cotton, there's probably not much you can, can plant that's actually worse for the ground than cotton. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, they're making $11,000 a year on hemp. And hemp that's is crazy. one of the, it's this regenerative thing that you plant it. And first of all, you use every single piece of the plant in some form of textile or herbal remedy, but it's also incredibly good for replenishing the earth. Mm -hmm. So they use it as a, a rotating crop. So yeah, it's good for the state. It's good for the state. So what lessons have you learned in selling companies? Because you've been a part of a couple of exits, big exits, Burt's Bees being one. Sure. We've been on the buying side for right. a long time. So I've always seen it from the buying side, but we've been on the sell side in five things. We obviously sold Burt's Bees and then a number of us stayed on there from three years to five years afterwards. So it was a, it was a good result. Two of the partners then went to run Seventh Generation, which is a eco-friendly household cleaning brand based in Vermont. And they exited that to Unilever. But in One Better Ventures, we've, we ran this informally beginning in 2013. So this was a sort of side hustle while we all had other jobs. And three of of those businesses that we advised have exited. It was a, a Burlington, North Carolina based, like really good sports nutrition, like Gatorade for real athletes, mm -hmm. not sugar water. And so they exited, <laughs> which was great. And there's a lesson in this for them. Then we exited a light therapy business. So skincare has moving from topical treatments to using dermatologists kind of light therapy treatments to treat everything from acne to anti-aging.
aging to hair growth to teeth whitening and other things. So we had a light therapy technology that we built to about $25 million and then sold to Johnson & Johnson. And then the last one is we had developed a skincare brand that we didn't bring to market, but we sold as an idea and a developed product range range to a company in San Francisco called Grove Collaborative. And so they, they commercialized it and we're just involved with that. So hmm. those are the five exits. And the lessons, yeah. which was your question. Yeah. So I really think there's three interesting lessons. Um, it all comes in threes, right? I'll forget <laughs> the third. Um, <laughs> One is don't focus on the exit. A lot of businesses, it's like, all right, I'm in business to exit. And, right. and we, we have found that our best exits are on businesses that we're planning to run for a century and hand off to somebody else who continues to run, run it. Because I think it drives the right behaviors in a business. But there's nothing more appealing to an acquirer than a business that's not for sale. <laughs> like, you know, when somebody's really hard selling their business, there's a reason for that usually. And I think they lose value because of that. So number one is don't make that your primary motivation, but it will actually happen. The second one is don't sell at all. That's the one that I probably learned about. Like Roxanne Quimby, who was the founder of Burt's Bees, ended up only selling 80% of her business for $150 million in 2004, three or four. She kept 20% of it. And four wow. years later, that 20% was worth what the original 80% was worth. So she made 380 or three, yeah, whatever, three and change on two bites of the apple. And you know, you got to have some courage and you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to believe that who you're handing it off to is actually going to build on what you did and make it better. But she risked about 20 million in cash in hand and ended up making $170 million <laughs> off it five years later. So good for her. She ended up taking that money and then buying like 100,000 acres of parkland in, in Maine. And then the last one is more on culture. I found that um, be transparent that you're in a process. Like companies do collapse when all of a sudden they show up one day and find out their business has been sold and they feel really misled by the leadership team. Number one is it's hard to keep a secret like that. And usually people will know because the this hallway chatter is usually pretty good. But if you're transparent with your organization that you are in the process and entertaining the idea and you'll share with them as much about what's going on as you can possibly. And they have to understand that there's a level of confidentiality where you can't talk about everything at all the time. But to the extent that you can kind of be transparent and bring your organization along with that, you get less of the freak out factor at the end. You get less of the, oh my God, I feel sold out. Or what am I going to do now? You get less of the personal anxiety about, are they going to relocate my business to California and I'm going to be out of the job? We just found that in the transition, people are much more comfortable with it. So don't focus on the sale, don't sell it all and bring your team along. Well, what's next for One Better Ventures? Where are you guys going? We are beauty and skincare people at our core. We've worked in, the, in that category in luxury brands and in mass brands and in all around the world for 30 years each. It's our passion. They're great categories. They're driven on innovation, product development, marketing. Like you never have to have the weekly debate about the value of marketing <laughs> because like in a beauty care business, it's really primary, which makes it nice. And it's just fun businesses. Yeah. Like consumers are highly engaged on what the next new thing, there's tons of great product development. And so we are now focused on, you know, sleep, vitamins, minerals, and supplements, a little bit of functional food, but we will, um, you know, build a personal care and beauty platform. And you're making investments. I know you would prefer to make them here, but you're making investments, it sounds like around the country, mainly east side of the country. I don't know. Yeah, we've tried to keep it from DC to Nashville to Atlanta with a right. real concentration in the triangle. And, and we've got about half of our portfolio that's actually within a two hour driving radius, which is great. That's nice. But we are now actually, you know, there's people that are interested in moving some businesses this way. So mm -hmm. um, that would be great. Like we'd love to get some sort of middle sized consumer products businesses in the area that are willing to relocate. And it's not, it's not as hard as you might think. There's a real good rationale for why they might do that because there's a lot of talent here. Yeah, so for sure. For sure. Well, thank you, Jim. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audio download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Alan. And Alan is spelled A-L-A-N for those that don't know. Again, audibletrial.com slash Alan.